Hello everyone, Hamsterboy here, and today I'll be explaining how I made my Senjin IO Gravity Falls music player. So let's get started. So to begin with, I have to ask, what is music? Well, this is a question that has plagued mankind for centuries. Okay, uh, maybe I should ask a better question. What is music made of? Well, it's a made of pressure waves traveling through the air. Accurate, but not the answer I'm looking for. Okay, let me be a little more specific. Let's see. Ah! How can we represent music in the form of information? That is just sheet music. You what? Skirt, skirt. Close enough, we can work with this. Alright, so in order for a computer to do useful work, we must provide it information it can work with. And in the form of music, well, Essentially, all a song really is, is just a string of notes, one after another. Now, every note has four variables that we can control, those being the pitch, the duration, the instrument, and the volume. With these, we can create an entire song. So with all that said, we can just sort of ignore volume as a variable because Sinjin I.O. doesn't allow us to dynamically change the volume of any given note, so we can basically just throw that to one side and ignore it. So that leaves us with three other variables, pitch, duration, and instrument change. And for the most part, we can also kind of ignore instrument change, usually we just choose one instrument and play the whole song in that instrument, but we'll get more into that when we actually get into it. So, with all that said, let's get into it. Alright, so welcome to the <coughs> smoggy world of Senjin IO. They really need to install a better air filter. I mean, really. Alright, so here we are in a prototype board, which basically shows off the evolution of how I came up with the design of making a music player. So, starting at the top, we have the most bare-bone, basic, straightforward, as simple as they can get music players you can think of. Where it literally is doing note, duration, note, duration, note, duration, repeatedly, over and over and over again. And if we simulate it, it's not bad, it works, but it can be massively improved. The problem with this is that you have the note on one line, and then on a separate line you have the duration, followed by the note, followed by duration, note, duration, and the note only takes up two characters, whereas the duration only usually takes up one character. But each memory cell can carry three digits, meaning that we could, in theory, compress the two into a single memory cell. The other issue with this is this memory block can hold up to 33 data positions, which is an odd number, and as a result, one lap around means that we get a weird parity issue. So, for those two reasons combined, I came up with this other design here, which is much better. So the way this works is, we compress the data with the duration being on the hundredths place, and then the pitch data being in the tens and ones place. And the way the code works here is, step one, we want to essentially grab the timing data. So we pull the entire number, put it into accumulator, then we grab the highest most digit, which in this case is a 2. We then move it to the data register to save it for later. But now we have a problem. Now we need the pitch data, but the pitch data was here, but uh, the way these memory blocks work in Sengen IO is they automatically increment every time you grab data from them, which is not ideal right now. So we need to actually go back one 
to reread the same data twice. So that's what this does. It basically just figures out where we are, puts it into accumulator, subtract one, and then write it back to force it back to where it was. Yeah, a bit clunky, but you know, first attempt, well, second attempt, it gets the job done. Then we grab the data a second time. Now we throw away the leading digit, remaining only the last two digits. And we move that to X2, which plays the note. And now we simply just sleep for the amount of time that the data register defines for us, which in this case is two. And we're ready to go back again. Now this design works, but it's a bit clunky. It has a lot of lines of code that just sort of dance the pointer up and down a lot, just so I can grab the same data twice it would be much better if we didn't have to do that. That is where GTW23 comes in. I decided to check out some of their code and see how they did the Rit Ashley IO. And what I found was surprisingly similar to what I came up with, but just done a bit better. So down here, we have an example of what they got. Now, in terms of how the data is stored, it's basically the exact same thing as before, where the leading digit is your timing data and the trailing digits are your note data, your pitch data. Except here, the job of timing and the job of pitch are separated out into two blocks. So let's run through it. So the first one just simply grabs the note and puts it into accumulator. Then it basically hot potatoes the note along to the next block like so. Now, since it passed the data along, we have the data in two places, they can act independently of each other. So this simply just gets a first digit and then simply sleeps for however long it needs to. Simple as that. And that's all it really cares about is grabbing data, passing it along, and then sleeping for an appropriate amount of time. Now, if we look at the second block, its job is a little bit more involved, but not by much. The first thing it does is it actually sets the instrument, where it moves the number two onto line three to change the instrument, which, yeah, we'll talk more about instrument changes later, but for now, that's how we can control the instrument, just by adding a line there. Now we simply wait until we get an input from the previous block, when we do get input, we move it to the accumulator. And now we can throw away the leading digit. And now that we have the trailing two digits, we can play the note. One little caveat here. Uh, we have a test greater than, and to see if the accumulator is greater than the number zero. Here's the thing. We'll never play a song with a note all the way down at zero. That's just never gonna happen. So, Instead, we repurpose the zero for a silence. If we have zero as a trailing bits, well, we can just treat that as, hey, just, just rest for a moment. Don't play any note. And so if the trigger greater than or test greater than fails, we simply do not play the note. Since it is greater than, it succeeds and we do play the note. And so we move it into the... Uh, X2, which plays a note. And voila! And that's basically how the code works on a simple level. Next, we'll take a look at the Gravity Falls circuit and give a general idea of how it's laid out. All right, so now we're back in the Gravity Falls music player. Allow me to give you a quick tour around the place, show you the sights. So the way the circuit is laid out is there are three major music blocks, here, here, and here. Now, the reason why I have three of them is because, well, uh, the FM blaster can only replay one single note at a time, and to get the song right, 
I need to play chords featuring up to three notes at a time, which is why are the three separate music blocks. Within each block, you have three separate memory modules, as well as a module which deals with the timing, as well as a module that deals with the pitch. Now, in this version, this module also deals with the instrumentation. We'll get into that in a moment. Now, in addition to the main blocks, we also have some helper circuitry around this. The most notable of which, highlighted here, will control which memory block we are reading from at any given time. The last thing to note are the two little circuits down in the lower right corner here. So this upper one basically just gives us a percussion beat to work from for the majority of the song. This lower one, however, well, we'll get into it in a moment. Alright, so now that we had an overview of how everything's laid out, let's take a closer look at the code. No, literally, let's zoom in. Alright, so immediately you may notice that the code looks a little bit more complicated this time around, but I assure you that it basically does the exact same thing, it's just does a little bit more. For you see, unlike the previous example where we only had one single block of memory to worry about, now we have three, and so we have to choose which one we want to pull our note data from. So... That is where this module up here comes in. Its job is to tell the other modules where in memory to pull our notes from. And its code is really simple. It just sleeps for a while and then it updates this simple IO wire to a one. It starts at a zero, becomes one, then it becomes two, then it becomes three. Simple as that. Meanwhile, this block, we have a bunch of test equals, whether it's 0, 1, or 2. Now, we don't have a 3, so when it becomes a 3, we get into this infinite loop error where it can't find anything, and so where that's essentially our halt functionality right there. Now, once it is successful at grabbing things, like here it's testing if it's 0, which is true, then we simply move data in and repeat the same process as before. Now, there's one slight difference, and that's we have a multiply by 2, where the timing data essentially doubles. So a 4 here will become an 8. Now, I'll explain why that is very important a little bit later, but moving swiftly along, we'll see that this block here does a very similar task as before where it simply sleeps until it gets data, moves the data in, digit set zero, and then this is where things get a little bit more interesting because it tests if whether or not it's greater than 10. Before we said simply zero, now we're saying 10. The logic being is if we don't need a zero note, we're not likely to need notes one through 10 either. And that is data we can use to set the instrument. So if it is in fact under 10, we can actually change the instrument to whatever value it was. If it's over 10, we can just simply play the note as is. Simple as that. And it means that for the cost of a single memory cell, we can actually encode instrument changes in the song itself. Meaning that we can dynamically change what instrument we play throughout the song which is actually used three times here. First to set the instrument to zero, a piano piece for the opening up and down bit. Then we set it to a two, which is more of a chime, which vaguely resembles whistling. So that's for the middle bit. And then towards the end of the song, we set it to a one, which is this sort of hollow chime, which vaguely resembles a whispering at the end of the song. Now, unfortunately, I... It is a bit of a hard transition between the main song and then the ending. I wish it was a bit of a smoother transition, but... Ah, well, it, it's Senjin I.O., what can you do? Um, I, I tried, but it's as good as it's going to get. And if we look here, we'll see the same as before, where if it's below 10, it just simply does not play a note. So, yeah, same as before. So that's basically how we produce the majority of the song, 
but there's still a few other bits of circuitry we haven't covered yet. Moving on down here, we'll see that there are two bits of circuitry that I've yet to explain. The first one is a percussion. Now this is very straightforward. First we set the instrument to a 9, then we sleep for 64 just to wait out the opening bit. We don't need any percussion there. Then we play a note value 50 and we wait for 4 steps. Then we play a note value 100 and wait for another 4 steps. Now this is where things get a little bit more interesting. You see, once we finish playing those steps, we then test whether the accumulator is greater than 40. If it is, we sleep for 999, which basically puts this into halt. But if it fails, we just simply add 1 and repeat the process. And yeah, it means that we play the percussion 40 times throughout the song. Simple as that. Alright, so moving on, so what is this big old mystery block that I've been putting off throughout the rest of this video? Well, it's a bit of a cheat, a little bit of a workaround, a little bit of a sneaky sneaky because the song is, um, interesting. You see, the way the timing works is, in Senjin I.O., the smallest unit of time is one. Okay, makes sense. You can only sleep for one unit of time. You cannot sleep for half a unit of time. So, okay, uh, I guess that means the default note length will be a 1. You know, set the sl shortest note to a 1 and you're good to go. Now, initially I did that, but I quickly realized that there were a few areas where some of the longer notes were taking somewhere in the order of 12 to 16 units to play. And well, as a result, we can only play a note that is 9 units long. If we want a longer note, we need to add a rest note in between. And that was just bloating out the song way too much. And so in order to solve that, I basically have the number in the timing. So what was a 4 now is a 2. What was an 8 is now a 4. But as a result, to get the timing back to being correct, we need to multiply it by 2. Now, why do we need such a weird timing? Well, it's a little flutter at the end of the opening piano piece, where it's going up and down a few times, and then at the very end it goes up and down through a few notes really, really quickly. And to do that little flutter thing at the tempo it needs to be, well that's where the problem comes in. It's fast, but the rest of the song is comparably slow. And so, instead of having some weird complex circuitry to try and fix or change the dynamic of how long a note takes, I decided to, you know, just fudge it. Just put it together and call it a day. And so, throughout the opening piece, the three main speakers play the three notes. But at the very end of that, when we need to do the flutter, only the high notes are played by the this FM blaster, and then the lower notes, instead of played by another FM blaster of the main body, it is controlled by this little circuit down here. And as you can see, its program is very simple. It only plays it once, where it moves instrument zero in, then it waits for a while, and then it plays a note, waits, plays a note again, and then it's done. And that's it. It only plays the lower half of the flutter. And that's it. And so, uh, yeah, that's basically how I created Gravity Falls theme song in Senjin I.O. Now, there is one thing that is missing from this that is popular in a lot of other Senjin I.O. songs. And that's loops, repeats, where you, you reuse bits of the code and you reuse more specifically bits of the memory where certain parts of the song, like the verse and the chorus, will come back a few times. And so you can reuse large sections of music by just simply looping back on yourself. Gravity Falls theme song doesn't do that. It basically just plays it through one shot and 
So as a result, there wasn't really any need for any looping circuitry to try and reuse old data. And so yeah, that's how it works. That's how I built it. Thank you, and have a good one. Take care, folks.